Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how's it going today? It's going great today, Tim. Our conversation that's coming up is one of those unique opportunities that we always like to capitalize on when we have an interview with a guest and it creates so much conversation that we have to have that guest back on to answer some questions, make some clarifications, and also elaborate on some of the details. And the details in this case are incredibly important. But before we get to that, Tim, what's important to me is how you're doing. How are you today? Thank you for asking. I am doing great and very excited to introduce this conversation with author and former sheriff John Wesley Anderson. This is part two of our conversation with John Anderson about the murder of John Bonet Ramsey. Of course, John Bonet was six years old when she was murdered on December 25th, 1996 in Boulder, Colorado. And if you haven't heard of part one, you ought to do that. It was only, I don't know, six weeks or so ago on the feed. So you want to scroll back a little bit to hear that. It got a lot of conversation going. So we had to have him back for part two. And we even asked some questions that were brought up on social media. Um, and we got to ask John these directly. I don't think we brought up Katy Perry yet at this point, but uh, we did bring up some conspiracy uh, theories. And I think that's important to address the conspiracy theories because while we don't want to give attention to the, the more ridiculous ones, while we don't want to draw a lot of attention to these, it is important to speak about the conspiracy theories because this is a case that has been going on for almost 30 years. And that means that there's been a lot of time to imagine these conspiracy theories and really what john wants to do is present the story the way the investigator lou smith was trying to showcase his evidence for the boulder pd which was incredibly detailed and exactly what needed to be done however for some reason this murder just took on this kind of perverse life of its own and what John's trying to do here is dampen those flames, right? And we'll have him on as many times as he needs to come on to address all this. And I think it's important for John to uh, sort of undo some of the damage that the media and the Boulder PD did um, in this case. And something that you should probably know if you haven't read the book, Lou Smith was hired by the DA's office, which is not the Boulder PD. The DA's office believed in an intruder theory while the Boulder PD never took their eyes off John Bonet's parents. Um, so you can see how a case is not going to get solved when the prosecuting office and the investigating office, they're just not on the same page. So it's, it's kind of a crazy scenario. And we should let you know that the audio is not great in this interview, especially in the beginning part with John. Um, in like the last 15 minutes or so, it's a little bit better, but the beginning, there's definitely a hiss. Hopefully you can get past that and listen on. And again, it would be nice to have John on again. So bring your questions. Make sure to tweet us or write us on social media at Crawl Space Podcast or Crawl Space Pod. And as long as you're out there on social media trying to communicate with us, you can also communicate with us through the area in which you leave a review and give us a good rating. Because honestly, that goes a long way and we really appreciate it. And Tim, you know what they'll really appreciate? This episode and all of the other episodes that we have, perhaps without the ads. Where could they go to find that? I think you're right. And listeners can find Crawlspace Premium now on Apple Podcasts. But if you're not an Apple user, you can go to crawlspace.supportingcast.fm and sign up there. What you'll get is ad-free episodes, early releases, and our weekly bonus show. So check that out. Everyone's talking about the weekly bonus show. They love it. All right, everyone, we're going to break quick for commercial here, and we'll be right back with part two of our conversation with John Wesley Anderson, author of Lou and John Bonet, great new book out by Wild Blue Press. Check it out if you haven't already, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the podcast, author John Anderson. How are you tonight? I'm well. Thank you, Tim. It's nice to be back with you and Lance. It's good to have you back, and it's pretty rare that we have a guest back on so soon after their original appearance, but 
there was no time to waste with this. And I'm going to apologize right off the bat that some of this conversation might be a little frustrating to you because you've probably heard some of these comments before, but we just couldn't let it go anymore. There's a lot of feedback about your episode that you did with us, a conversation about your book, Lou and Jean Bonnet, about the Jean Bonnet Ramsey murder. And we just need to address it. So anyway, welcome back. Thank you for taking the time to uh, join us again under, um, you know, in such short notice. You're you're very welcome and no apology necessary. I'll tell you that that last episode went by so quick and uh, there were uh, it seemed like, you know, we just had to rush to, to bring it to conclusion. So I'm delighted to be back. And especially now that you guys have had a chance to read the book a little more thoroughly, you've got other inputs, you know, from some of your listeners. So I, I'm I think this will be a good session. Before we get too deep, I would like to ask you um, about the impact that the book is making. And then I heard a rumor that there's an audio book coming. I could confirm that rumor. In fact, the voice uh, actor, Stephen Bowley, B-O-W-L-E-Y is his name. And I got to meet him and he had just finished up his reading, uh, the, his narration of the audio book. So um, as soon as it gets uh, produced, I think within the next couple of weeks, we'll have that out. And great. Do- Judy, uh, who commented on YouTube, says, I wish the book was in audio format. So there's your answer, Judy. The book will be in audio format. So fantastic. You know, this is my first book to have out in all four uh, formats, uh, hardcover or softcover. Usually I've had to make, you know, the decision or the publisher made the decision for me. And it's my first ebook and uh, and also the first audio book. So it's nice to have all four formats available for however the reader or the listener wants to access it. Very cool. Now, have you heard from the Boulder police um, since the book has been published? Not a word, really discouraging. I was hoping that there would be some interest with, um, I know there's a new commander in charge of the investigation and there has to be information in the book that they could not possibly have known. Well, or I expect that maybe they want to dispute something, and that hasn't happened either. So it's really been kind of frustrating, just this silence. I had, right before the book was published, requested through an email to the police chief, and I copied the DA and the commander, who at that time was Tom Trujillo, and one of the other commanders I had asked uh, for um, a um, third uh, meeting with our Smith family team, and the that meeting request was never even replied to. They just ignored it. So it's really, really been discouraging. Like, what's your opinion on that? Do you think that that's just like they don't want to say anything because they don't want anything to be taken the wrong way or their words twisted and used against them? Like, silence is the best answer on their end. Yeah, I think that that's accurate, Lance. Um, there's also this uh, belief that, oh, we can't reveal anything on an ongoing investigation because it might compromise the integrity of the investigation. And I respect that because I was an investigator, homicide deve- uh, investigator for years. And I think that that's a really good response for the first year, two, three, five, 10, 15, 20. But when you get to that, about that 25 year mark, we're now at year 26. You have to kind of say, well, well, how's that policy working for you? And, and, you know, I, I think it's time, you know, to, to step outside of that traditional box. Um, one of the biggest disappointments in the lack of communication with the Boulder PD in our Smith family team is they did put out a canned response. Um, I don't act but I shouldn't take credit. I don't know if this was a response to me or, or media or, or how this came about, but there was kind of a canned um, uh, generic response that Boulder PD put out with a media release that said, oh, we're doing all we can, you know, with the DNA, you know, we're, we, we visited whatever, 19 states, we've conducted all these different interviews and um, uh, we're pursuing advanced DNA technologies. But what, we, what our team knows for certain is that the three labs that we have been in contact with, private DNA labs that are doing cutting edge uh, DNA technology, that we have provided the name, email, phone number, uh, phone phone uh, number for these private labs and offer to pay for the advanced technology uh, through our GoFundMe page. And those three labs have never been contacted 
and our offer to pay for that that funding has not materialized. So what they're telling the media and the public public through the media is not consistent with what um, advanced technologies that we've certainly come across. What we lack is the actual physical evidence, the the genetic material that is often needed to do some of the advanced technologies. Okay, so yeah, I did want to ask about this, um, and it sounds like they're playing some media games a little bit. Is the question of familial DNA being attempted in this case, is that impossible to answer, or, or can you confirm that it's been used? Well, it's difficult for me to answer not having access to the DNA, but what I can say is that it is 100% effective and eliminating people of interest because our team has done that. Boulder PD has done that too. Even when Lou Smith was alive, his um, list of persons of interest, several had been eliminated through DNA. When he um, first uh, joined the uh, Boulder Task Force, I think the initial report was like nine genetic markers. And then I think it uh, grew to 10 fairly quickly by 2008 when the long johns um, that John Bonet was wearing was retested. The technology had evolved up at that point to where they could use trace or touch DNA. And that produced another, um, I think it was either three or four uh, genetic markers, loci that gave them, I think, a total of 14. And why that benchmark was important is, uh, and I may be off on the numbers because they're, they're kind of fluid. I think at the time, CODIS, the Combined DNA Information System, the national system, was requiring 12 genetic markers. And, and so it, it surpassed that. Um, what's, what's really fascinating with the uh, other cold cases that we've been following uh, some are 30, 35, even 40, 42 years old. When the uh, police go back and, and reevaluate the original crime scene uh, evidence, sometimes it's clothing like what we had with John Bonet, sometimes it's other genetic material. What they're able to do now with more sophisticated DNA technology is that they can search for much, much smaller, very minute quantities with the same amount of material, they can do more uh, in in the way of searching for, for people. Where I know at one time Boulder PD said that, well, you know, we, we don't want to use up the, the DNA because it would be consumptive, some of the tests. And that was a legitimate um, argument maybe two or three or five years ago. It's not now because if you have a small, very tr- small, tiny trace amount of DNA, genetic material, instead of using it all in a consumptive uh, test, what you can do with using such such small quantities as is uh, picograms, you can act you you can take that same small amount but divide it in half or or even a third or a quarter. Uh, so you're you're doing more with smaller amounts of the genetic material, and and that has helped solve other cases as well. But what our team has done, our Smith team, has used the markers that were there originally um, from 2008 uh, it, and uh, eliminated persons of interest that were on uh, Lou's uh, list of, of his uh, potential candidates. Uh, necessarily call them suspects because we're not investigators, but Lou listed um, dozens and dozens of persons of interest that we've been focused on. Through the DNA results that have been done, there have been people that have been removed, and that includes the Ramsey family, correct? That's very correct, Tim. And that's an important thing that the book tries to get across, is that um, the immediate Ramsey family were all eliminated within three weeks of the murder. The murder happens, just as a refresher, December 26th of 1996, by, the, by uh, December 30th of 96, the original DNA, physical evidence, and blood samples of all the Ramsey family, plus other people who had been in the house, um, uh, friends, uh, there, there were, I think the original submittal was 10 uh, genetic markers, that, I mean, uh, blood samples that included uh, John and Patsy and John Andrew Ramsey and Burke and Melissa and um, uh, people who weren't even in the house. 
but those um, original standards were submitted four days after the murder, which is pretty extraordinary. And the Colorado Bureau Investigation CBI lab completed that initial um, test on the DNA genetic markers and reported back to Boulder Police um, on January 15th of 97. So within three re weeks of the murder, that analysis came back and the report uh, specifically states that all the, the people that were listed in the original submittals have been excluded as potential contributors for the DNA. And then in the um, 2008 report um, uh, that gave a little bit more information because it was a little bit more advanced uh, testing mythology, and it did say that the DNA it confirmed that it's not any member of the Ramsey family. It's male, which was known within three weeks of the murder. So it eliminated, of course, Patsy or all, all female contributors. But then it, um, in 2008, what the additional genetic markers allowed them to do was confirm that the uh, genetic material on the long johns was consistent with what was on the underwear and also consistent with what was under the uh, fingernails of John Bonet. So, so the markers, although they weren't a complete profile of the entire uh, set of markers, they were sufficient to say yes. They're this, they're, they're unknown male and consistent in all three locations. Okay, that is great to hear. Okay, so it's pretty undeniable that that's the killer's DNA then that was found under her fingernails and on her body. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, Tim, one of the frustrating things is you'll see uh, talking heads, you know, that'll say, oh, well, you know, this could have been, you know, who knows, a Chinese garment worker or could have been, you know, um, uh, it, they come up with really bizarre explanations. And, uh, uh, you know, well, it could have been somebody that she just came in contact with, casual contact. Well, it, it, you don't have casual contact with a six-year-old little girl and deposit genetic material on the crotch of her panties. You, you don't leave that on her uh, uh, undergarments, like the long johns. And it's undeniable that the uh, fingernail scrapings was underneath her, her fingernails. And that meant that she, and it is consistent, as Lou pointed out, that the fingernail marks that were above the garrote that was around her throat show these crescent-shaped uh, marks where she's clawing, you know, uh, trying, trying to breathe. So, it, it, you know, for someone to come up with some um, argument to try to explain away that DNA, it's just not based in logic. Yeah. I'm glad that you said that someone trying to come up with some other explanation of this DNA isn't based in logic, right on the heels of giving this really graphic depiction of how this little girl is clawing at her own neck in order to breathe, there are people out there who will say, well, they must have screwed up the DNA samples. They must have screwed this up. I mean, they must have. And th that must irritate you to no end, especially when, again, coming off the heels of like, didn't you just hear what was said, that this girl right. was clawing at her neck? Like... How, how do you approach that? Like, if someone were to say to you, well, how can you guarantee me that that DNA wasn't mishandled or something went wrong in the lab because they were unfamiliar with how to test DNA? Really good question, Lance, and it, it is frustrating. And, um, you know, p people formed opinions very early in, in this investigation, you know, if they were old enough, you know, to be, you know, reading tabloids or watching it on the news. Yeah, after 26 years, I am frequently reminded when I do an author talk or visit with somebody about the case that someone will say, well, you know, I don't really, well, you two are a good example that, you know, they'll say, well, I was in the third grade. I don't remember that, you know, uh, discussing this, but they might remember it, you know, after they graduated high school or they're older because the case, you know, has had, and rightfully so, a lot of high visibility over the last 26 years. So um, uh, I think, I think what the book is, is, was intended to do is happening is initiating discussion, continuing the dialogue, keeping it from from just fading away, but also I think causes people to rethink 
you know, well, how can you explain the foreign unknown male DNA? How can you explain things like there not being um, a stun gun in the home? How can you explain there's not black duct tape, a roll of black ta duct tape, or any remnants of any black duct tape like was found on John Bonet's mouth anywhere in the home? The parachute cord, the the the, the white uh, 550 uh, paracord. There was not a roll. There was no uh, end of that cord anywhere else in the house. And the Ramsey said, well, we, we don't even know what paracord is. We've never owned that. We've never owned a stun gun. We don't have any black duct tape. So what Lou was constantly um, uh, reminding people is this is evidence not only of an intruder into the home, but it also goes to his intent. His intent, he didn't come in with, you know, a gun to shoot somebody. He came in with a stun gun to mobilize somebody which is consistent with what's on the ransom note. And I think that's another concern uh, that the uh, frustration, Lance, back to your word, that, that I have had is people locked in to um, uh, the fact that, yeah, the, the note was written in the house and it was written on um, uh, Patsy's notebook and with a pen that was on that desk. And that desk was kind of in a common area where other people could, use it wasn't too far from the uh, stairwell right off the kitchen where the the ransom note was found by John Bonet's mother that morning people you know say well that that suggests that she wrote the note well that's not necessarily true it meant that the kidnapper didn't bring a written ransom note into the house he had time to write that while he was in the house and when someone says well i think you know burke wrote that well, when you read the note, it's it's a two and a half page rambling um, uh, note that you know talks about um, different quotes movies, you know about you know John don't grow a brain and other quotes, uh, things that a nine year old you know is not going to one they probably ever watched those movies, especially with parental guidance. They're pretty, some of them are pretty violent movies, but but that's not the vocabulary that a nine year old boy would would use so so that's nonsensical e either and when you when you talk to some people and they say well i still think the mother wrote the note i i think they're quick to dismiss the fact that there are five other uh question document examiners several who reach the opinion well we can't you know rule her out or or there's not evidence to to, to indicate that she wrote the note but there is one a uh, very experienced um, uh, forensic uh, question document examiner um, who, who was with the uh, U.S. Secret Service who gave his professional opinion that uh, Patsy was not the author. And I know we talked a little bit about the, the note and the handwriting in the first uh, uh, session, so I don't want to uh, rehash that because I know people can go back to that if they want to. But the point that I would really like to emphasize here that is often lost is that if Patsy and John would have taken the polygraph um, and asked the question, do you know who killed John Bonet? And, you know, did, with Patsy, did you write the note? And they failed the polygraph. No doubt, across the, the U.S., the world, people say, see, that that's evidence that they committed that crime. But the opposite happened. Both Patsy and John Ramsey took polygraph examinations by one of the leading polygraph operators in the nation, and they both passed. And the questions, do you know who killed John Bonet? No. And Patsy was specifically asked the question, did you write the ransom note? And she said no. And she passed those questions. So people may say, well, you know, they just chopped around to find, you know, somebody that would pass them. Well, when you look at the integrity of the polygraph examiner, Dr. Glebe, he was one of the leading uh, experts in, in the, uh, at the time, he taught the FBI polygraph operators. He was doing pre-employment examination for five, at the time, five uh, police departments in the California area, um, the state of California. But those results were independently sent to another competent, um, nationally recognized polygraph operator who validated the polygraph results from Dr. Glebe. I think um, that people sort through facts try to you know hang on to something that might support their opinion and then rapidly dismiss things that don't 
I, I think that may be what happened with the Boulder police. And I think that's an example of inexperience. For better or worse, Boulder PD didn't, has not uh, had a lot of uh, violent crime investigative experience. Their supervisory chain of command within the investigations division had never led a homicide investigation. So it was really kind of a blessing when Lou Smith came in because he had the depth of experience that they did not. Over 200 homicide cases, proven experience in solving unknown uh, cold cases, even even uh, kidnap uh, murders. The Boulder police, did law enf- Boulder law enforcement in general, uh, were, were very quick to, to dismiss what Lou had to offer and hang on to these theories or these assumptions that some of the Boulder detectives asserted that simply were not supported by the factual evidence. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. You mentioned movies that were referenced in the ransom note. I, I thought that was really fascinating because you mentioned like five or six of them. I believe right. it's Speed, Nick of Time, Seven, Ruthless People, and the movie Ransom that had just come out. Right, yes. And it was shown in Boulder at the time. In in fairness, I shouldn't take credit for that work. That was really Lou uh, who did the, the work and, and watched the movies and sat there very carefully and wrote down uh, phrases that were similar to what was written in the uh, ransom note. And Lou's like me, he wouldn't, you know, normally watch those kinds of movies. So it's probably hard to, to sit through there. You know, another thing that's really um, a tragedy in this case and a little known is that Boulder police insisted on um, the Ramseys and to all, all three, um, uh, Patsy, uh, John Sr. and um, Burke uh, give handwriting examples and both John Ramsey and Patsy were required to write over and over and over again with their handwriting repeating what that note had said and it was a terribly graphic note threatening to behead their daughter and uh, belittling you know John and and for Boulder PD to to keep coming back and say well we need you to write that again and write it again and write it again and write it again it was really, um, I think most people would probably say, hey, you know, forget you, you know, I'm not doing that again. Uh, same way with uh, some of the um, uh, evidence standards that uh, uh, the family uh, were put through. And a lot of people don't realize this, you know, they, they think, well, okay, uh, yeah, they, they had to give, you know, a DNA sample. Well, they gave a blood sample, hair sample, handwriting sample, in pubic hair samples. Now, those samples have to be collected in person and they have to be plucked. And now think about that. When someone says, oh, the Ramses weren't cooperative, well, how much more cooperative could a person be? You know, at some point, you know, someone asked one of us, you know, for pubic hair samples and we're going to be watching that and they got to be plucked. You know, I think, uh, you know, uh, that epitomizes how that family went out of their way to give every uh, sample just so Boulder PD would, would, would finally reach the conclusion, well, I guess it's nobody in the family, and, and then go about trying to catch the killer. But in 26 years, that has not happened, and that is really, really unfortunate. I'm really curious about why people will keep going to the ransom note and how that could have possibly been written by either parent or any member of the family to make it look like it was a kidnapping. What, why wouldn't they just type the note? Why would they even open themselves up to handwriting being analyzed? If they had the fourth, like the wherewithal to say, let's make this look like a kidnapping. Why would they, why would they, why would their plan fail? Like stop right there and not continue like, well, we should probably type this so the handwriting doesn't come back to us. And is is equally baffling is the theory that, well, they they covered up an accidental death to make it look like a kidnapping. Well, this was anything but accidental. And when you read the autopsy report and the violence and the, the sexual assault 
and um, it, you know, they, you know that she was tied up to make it look like a kidnapping. No, the person who who tied those knots, who fashioned that garrote, that was done with someone with advanced training and skill and knot tying. Uh, same way with the uh, wrist ligatures. Those weren't just tied up, you know, to make her look like, you know, she couldn't get away. Those were slip knots, and they were deliberately tied in such a fashion that the more she struggled, the tighter that they got. So there's overwhelming evidence that this intruder really planned this this kidnapping out. And uh, what Lou believed, wrote the ransom note, left it behind when John Bonet was still alive. And Lou thinks that the killer had her downstairs in the basement when he's fashioning the garage. And the evidence of that was, you know, the, the hair that was tangled in with the, the parachute cord around the handle, the paintbrush handle. And Lou thought that something had, um, in the, the intruder's plan, fell apart in the basement. You know, he couldn't get her out the window or something happened where he went from um, what his intended crime was, the kidnap for ransom, to um, the sexual assault and the murder. Now, in fairness, someone with that mentality probably would have been involved, you know, in a sexual crime, you know, had he gotten her out of the house. But Lou believed that the, uh, the evidence indicated she was alive at the time that the note was written and that uh, something happened in the basement that changed the course from a kidnapping to, to a murder. Right. Now, we saw a lot of comments about how the paintbrush was Patsy's. It was. Yeah. Wait, now, what is that? does that tell you anything? For me, it tells me that the killer fashioned the garrote in situ, uh, I-N-S-I-T-U, in situ, in place, and that he is con- he's in contact with John Bonet, which meant he had already removed her from her bedroom. He has her downstairs. He's trying to control her. This is in the um, right outside of the um, wine cellar where the boiler room is at. For those of you that have looked at the book and read the di- or seen the diagrams of Lou's uh, PowerPoint presentation, so he he's trying to control the girl. She must be struggling, and he reaches for something to fashion that garrote. And that paint uh, tray um, was on the floor uh, near the door of the wine cellar. And he would have uh, reached around and grabbed something to use as a handle. What's also interesting is the handle was too long for what he needed. And so he broke it in three pieces. He uh, broke the bristle end off, threw it into the uh, tray where he, where the paintbrush had originally been located. So he's discarding it. So he doesn't need that length. And then the handle that's left, he breaks in half. So there's three pieces. There's the tip, the middle. The middle is what's used for the garrote. The end where the bristles is left behind. What's fascinating is the um, uh, tip of the handle of the paintbrush was never found. So when someone's thinking that, well, it was Pansy's paintbrush and she therefore committed the murder, well, then what did she do with the um, end of the, the paintbrush? And what we talked about, I think, in the, the first uh, episode program uh, that we um, d- d- did earlier was this idea of, not idea, this theory of the transfer theory, theory of interchange, that whenever a suspect uh, commits a crime, he either takes something or leaves something at the scene. And that's what Lou knew very well. And so when Lou itemized what the killer brought into the house, the stun gun, the duct tape, the parachute cord, what he left behind, the remnants of the cape that was over the mouth, the uh, garage, but the end of the paintbrush was missing, as as was the stun gun. So those items that he took with him give some insight into his his psyche. So the end of that paintbrush that that meant something. He didn't just discard it by throwing it in the paintbrush like he did the bristled end. So he he had to have removed that from the house because the house was pretty thoroughly searched m- m- more than once. And that that end of the paintbrush was never accounted for. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question, and it's just a a really simple like 
It's going to be a really simple like yes or no. Uh, did Lou know the Ramseys prior to this? No. Okay. I'm going to read you a comment, and it's it's a YouTube comment. It says, in my opinion, it is my opinion that Detective Smith became too emotionally entangled with the Ramseys and lost his objectivity as a result. Smith was an, a skilled investigator, but he was dead wrong about the Ramsey case. There was no, quote, intruder. There were only three people inside that house when John Bonnet was murdered. One or more of those three was the perpetrator. And then there's a couple, there's a comment there about how Smith, uh, another comment, Smith knew there was no intruder. He was complicit in helping create reasonable doubt for his friends, the Ramseys. So I think there's this misconception or people are just making up the fact that he was good friends with them for years before coming into this and all of that detective work all of that police work that he he spent his life training to do all of that success that he had he just threw it out the window for for his friends because he couldn't handle his good friends murdering their own daughter yeah that that's really that's really sad it's almost not even worth talking about because it's absolutely ridiculous yeah, it is in a multiple le- levels. But I can clarify, not only from having talked to Lou in detail, but I've also, uh, you know, people can have an opinion, but it's based upon something else. You know, it's not firsthand. You know, it's that they read this or they came up with this theory from watching a documentary or they read in someone else's book. But I, I think I'm probably one of the few people who can say, I, I formed an opinion on Patsy and John Ramsey as parents firsthand. I'm one of the people who actually got to meet them. And uh, Patsy passed away four years after the murder. So I only met her one time. But I met John and have been in continual contact with him for the last 26 years. And I've had dinner with him. I've had breakfast with him. I've talked to him on the phone. I've shared emails with him. I've kept him in the loop on um, this this book as it's continuing to evolve, not because I'm trying to maintain a friendship with him, uh, like you know people might accuse. Uh, Lou never accepted a penny from the Ramseys um, for his investigation. He When he went to work for the Boulder DA's office as part of the Ramsey task force, when he first started, he really was of the opinion, like so many other people, that, you know, it probably was, you know, one of the parents, you know, involved in this because he had also uh, li- had limited information, you know, the misperception about no footprints in the snow and, and no forced entry. But within days of him getting access to the crime scene and um, uh, the, the crime scene photos, the autopsy photos, seeing the evidence that, you know, well, there's no footprints in the snow because there was no snow on the south side of the house and that the window is open. It had a broken pane and it was standing wide open and this suitcase was propped up below the window that Blue believe was used by the intruder to exit the home. What a lot of people don't know is that the Boulder police have only officially, officially eliminated one person out of all of the people that were potential suspects, that person was Burke Ramsey. Now that's an interesting observation. A lot of people have missed that. So I think when people are thinking, oh, you know, Burke did it. Well, out of all the people that Boulder PD could have eliminated, they only picked one and it was Burke Ramsey. Well, that's really fascinating Be- because a lot, a lot of people were, have said that, uh, that Burke was, had some odd behavior um, there was a story, there was some comments about a golf club. Did he, did he approach John Bonet with a golf club or something like that at one point? I've, I've never heard that. If anything, it's the opposite. You know, he and John Bonet really got along well. They were, you know, they played together. They uh, really enjoyed one another. He was a big brother. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. What about spare keys? This was a, a very interesting point. Um, how many spare keys were there to the Ramsey house and who had them? There may be as many as 26. And um, one of the things when the Ramseys bought the home originally, 
of course, there was previous owners. It was an old house, 120-year-old house. And they had remodeled, were in the process of remodeling the house. So they never changed the locks from the previous owners. Then when they were doing the remodel, they gave the contractor a key and then um, the subcontractors a, a key and people who needed to come in for whatever painting or carpeting often gave copies of that the key out. And then um, one of the families across the street who, uh, when the Ramses were away on travel, came over, checked on the house and sometimes would pick up the mail. They had a key. And when that key went missing, they lost it. Then the Ramses gave them another key. The housekeeper had a key. So there were many copies of, of keys. But again, that's assuming that the intruder went through a locked door um, in Lou's opinion, and, and I think it's validated that entry was made through the basement by the intruder lifting that heavy metal grate, crawling through the broken window, and where, where he uh, pointed to um, some of the vegetation and debris in the uh, window well, and there was like these little white peanut, packing peanuts, you know, and some of that debris had been found in the house to include in the wine cellar where John Bonet's body was found. Another fascinating photo that Lou talked to me about and, and others, not just me, but that metal grate, when you look at it, there were grass that had grown and it was underneath that metal grate. Well, grass doesn't grow under a grate, you know, it'd grow over the top of that metal. So Lou also suggested that that's evidence that the intruder left. And then uh, when he put the grate back down, that it trapped that grass underneath the grate. So yeah, the keys are of interest, but I think there's uh, abundant evidence to support what Lou's conclusion was that the intruder gained entry through that broken window in the basement. And one of my final questions comes from another comment about the reference of the kidnapping kit. And people seem to be, I don't know if they're splitting hairs or they're just questioning the verbiage used there like it wasn't technically a kidnapping kit can you just maybe clear that up a little bit i don't know where that term came from kidnapping kit i don't know if that was lou's original description but what he was trying to get across is when you itemize these items that the kidnapper brought into the house that there's evidence that he used those items and that he took several of these items with them when you look at what was left behind the remnants of the duct tape, the black black duct tape, the remnants of the parachute cord that was used for the, the ligatures and for the murder weapon, the garrote. When you look at the stun gun, those items of evidence that were, were foreign to the crime scene, that they weren't in the house before or after the crime. So the insured had to bring that with him and take that with them when they left. So what they... What the intruder clearly had in mind was um, to mobilize somebody, uh, bind them up, muffle their uh, with a duct tape over the mouth that they they couldn't scream, that there was some way to try to quiet them. And all of that is consistent with trying to remove somebody forcibly from that home. And so when you compare that to what's written on the ransom note, you have to conclude that Lou was right, that it was a kidnap. So whatever the tools are called, if somebody does not want to call it a, a kit, then that's fine. But that's what these items were used for, was to abduct the little girl and attempt to remove her forcibly from, from the home. Right. That makes sense. I mean, when you just look at the ransom note and you look at the items that this ha like contained, like all of that suggests kidnapping. All of that su suggests abduction. So I guess it's irrelevant what the final result was it does like that doesn't really matter when you're looking at like the items individually like you'd say yeah those are items that one would use to quiet subdue and and abduct right mm -hmm. can you tell us about the slip knots that were tied what does that tell you i guess it tells me as somebody that and told Lou that it was someone who had really kind of an advanced uh knot tying skill or capability or training slip knots I, I suppose there were people that more commonly know how to tie a slip knot but what it in effect did was when she struggled the, the more she struggled the tighter that they became so it's an indication what it tells me 
is that she was alive when they were applied. But when you when you also compare the parachute cord, the paracord 550, it's the same cord that was used to fashion the garrote. Well, that garrote is a very unusual murder weapon. It, and it was used not just to kill her, it was really to control her, you know, to, to uh, cut off her airway, restrict the, the airway, so that she would be rendered um, uh, almost unconscious near death. But what killed her was, in addition to the strangulation, was also a blow to the head, a severe blow from a blunt forced object that caused a, an eight inch depressed skull fracture. And so the autopsy report says that that was strangulation as a primary cause, secondary uh, causal factor was a, a depressed skull fracture. And Lou had found a um, medical expert who made the, the statement that it would be consistent with being uh, dropped on your head from a three-story building that had that much force. So that's not something that would happen if you accidentally drop the child onto the, the sink or the bathtub, or, or even if you forcibly tried to throw the, the child, as some people alleged, you know, that Patsy and, you know, some fit of anger over a bedwetting incident, you know, accidentally hit her head against the porcelain sink or, or something. Well, it, that's not uh, um, the case here. The physical evidence clearly showed that didn't intend to kill her with the uh, garrote. It was used, again, as a strangulation device. And what ultimately killed her was the additional blow to the head with the blunt force object, possibly a baseball bat. Right. And there was a bat that was found outside, too. Is is it confirmed that that was the bat used or not exactly? It's never been confirmed. There's actually two aluminum baseball bats, one in the backyard and one in the front yard. The one in the backyard, which is near the butler door um, on the north side of the house, that did have a fiber on it uh, that interest Lou. And I th think fiber matched something in the basement. I can't remember now if it was a carpet fiber or it was a fiber off of the dubay that was in the uh, suitcase. But there was something, uh, some material, a fiber of some and that I remember Lou in his notes said it was consistent with what was in the basement. So it suggested that maybe that bat was actually in that basement and may have came in, come in contact with the floor or this duvet or something to attract that, that fiber. Uh, that's funny. I actually just, <laughs> I just opened up your book and it, it was from the basement. It was oh. from the basement. I literally just opened it up and it happened to be right oh. at that point. It says basement basement carpet. It was found on the bat. The fiber from the basement carpet was found on the bat. Thank you. Maybe Lou's helping us out here. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other things I wanted to get in, Tim, before we conclude, if I might, and we had talked about this uh, before we started the recording, is that uh, in the book, as you guys know, in the hardcover, softcover, are um, uh, 36 uh, uh, photos that I selected from Lou's PowerPoint slide. And they're in black and white. But if you, uh, are, if someone's interested in seeing more in the um, um, ebook, uh, those same 36 slides in color. But on the audio book, of course, we weren't going to have the ability to have any photos there. And so the publisher, Wild Blue Press, uh, give you the website, wildbluepress.com, and they uh, posted uh, an additional 20 slides in color of loose PowerPoints on their website. So between what's in the book and what's on the website, there's a total of 56 slides that I selected from a 632 slide uh, presentation. And so you can get both color and black and white, and it'll give you um, a much, especially the color. When you look at the stun gun uh, wounds, uh, injuries on the skin, and you look at the triangular reddish abrasions that are precisely 3.5 centimeters apart, consistent with the air taser stun gun that Lou had found, that matches uh, perfectly. So I think there can be very little doubt that a stun gun was used twice on the little girl, once on the face, on the right side of her jaw, and then uh, a second time uh, in the basement on her back. Well, John... This has been uh, another great conversation. We uh, want to thank you for your time and your work. 
on this case. We really appreciate it. Well, I just feel like we're going to be talking again. I feel like this isn't <laughs> this isn't goodbye forever. I feel like you're going to be coming back on again. I think that there's going to be more developments and just more things to talk about because I mean, when we talk about this, an hour goes by and you we've, you know, didn't even realize it because there's just so much here. So, yeah, till next time. Well said. I'll look forward to that and and it's really not about selling the book. It really is about telling the story, the telling the story of Lou and, and John Bonet. And I just want to thank both you, Lance and Tim, for your dedication, continued interest in the case and getting it out in front of your listeners. And that, you know, we hope that your listeners will tell 10 people, they'll tell 10 people, and that we can turn the corner and communicate the message that the Ramseys are innocent. They were not involved in any way in this case. The DNA proves that. But also, and maybe even as important, is this case is still solvable. The DNA can still help identify the killer of John Bonet.